balance for them to get them all done. And what we do without our support, and, um, we'd like to thank Brett and Paul, who are two of the husbands in this team. Can you guys thank you. We are Survivors Teaching Students Saving Women's Lives. It's a program that's um, brought to you by the Ovarian Cancer National Alliance of DC, but it's also, um, we're also affiliated with the Wisconsin Ovarian Cancer Alliance, which is right here in the great state. We would like to uh, especially thank Honoree Pate. This is our second time talking to the graduating PAs and um, just her advocacy on behalf of education regarding the whole ovarian cancer experience and what a key component you are in early detection just really warms our hearts because we know that that's the answer. Um, oh yeah, you know she's the director of education. We've taken the survey and we're grateful for that. Ovarian cancer has been referred to since about 2007 as the disease that whispers. And we're here to get with this. I'm Laura Clark Hansen. I'll be the facilitator, but I'm also a survivor. With us is also Pam Wilhelmsen from the end, and Jan McNally in the middle. And you'll hear more about their stories in a few minutes. Some key information before we begin includes. Ovarian cancer, and this is always hard for me to say, especially when my beloved friends are with me, it's the most lethal of the gynecologic cancers. Um, one of um, the five leading causes of cancer death overall in women. <coughs> 22,000 women approximately are diagnosed annually, and 15,000 die annually. Right now, I read a statistic, there's 178,000 of us living um, right now. And the reason so many die is because we're being diagnosed in the advanced stages of the disease, stages three and four. And the reason for that is there's no reliable test currently for early detection. But, but though there isn't a medical um, test that can be run through a laboratory, what there are are warning signs that women experience even in the early stages. And um, the, the research of this amazing woman, Dr. Barbara Goff, has validated this and is being replicated. So we know that this is true, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Women aren't being screened during their you know, regular exams for this disease, <coughs> but that can be changed by simply asking a few direct questions about um, their circumstances. And, We'll talk about this more at the end. If you're interested in accessing a symptom diary for women, you know, just to have access to in terms of overall education, it's free. You can download it off Walter's website. Bing, bang, boom. Um, women are educated. So what we're going to talk about a lot today are symptoms because we know that that is the early detection test. They include. pelvic or abdominal pain or pressure. And these are the classic symptoms that Dr. Barbara Gaw um, found most commonly in um, her research. Difficulty eating or feeling full quickly, something I really didn't experience. <laughs> that would have been welcome, actually. Urinary symptoms, frequency or urgency. Um, the survivors will share their specifics. There's a, an acronym that can help you remember, B-E-A-T, bloating, eating and feeling full quickly, abdominal pain, and you got a tinkle, 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 okay? All right. You are at increased risk if you have a personal family history of breast, colon, or ovarian cancer. Let's do this together. <laughs> Brain and body parts. Rest. Colon. Or ovarian. Increasing age increases your risk. Nulliparity. Who knew? Who knew what this 
Do you guys know what the means? Of course you do. Of course you I don't. That means you didn't have any, this was a baby free zone. <laughs> if you test positive for the BRCA1 and the BRCA2, and if you're of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. My friend Cynthia is. Protective factors include use of oral contraceptives, having breastfeeding children, having bilateral stomachs. I used to do television radio voiceovers, and I used to do medical stuff, and I lay a trip on this, I don't know. Having bilateral tubal ligation or hysterectomy, having prophylactic. <laughs> Pro black. <laughs> so is it. Thank you. Oophorectomy. If a woman is suspected of having ovarian cancer, her chances of survival increase dramatically if they're developed by a gynecologic oncologist. Refer, 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 refer. Um, in the survival studies, <coughs> Forward, there's going to be some things that you won't hear. You'll hear a lot of really personal stuff, but you're not going to hear doctors' names or nurses' names. You're not going to hear about locations of treatment centers or where we're from. And you're not going to hear about service providers. And the reason for this is, I mean, it's obvious. We don't, if someone has a negative story that they want to share, we don't want to, this is no locality. This um, certainly isn't about the this is really about helping you guys really understand the difficulty of diagnosing this disease. So, we'll begin with Jamie. And do you want to move the phone? Go. You're going to be in my hands. about you taking the time to listen to my story. Um, I think if, if you listen to what we're saying and remember it as you go out into practice, if one day you might be able to help a young woman. Um, I am currently 47 years old, but my story started back when I was 34 years old. I had just delivered my third child in six years, and I um, had a very difficult pregnancy. I was diagnosed at 16 weeks with an ovarian cyst on my right side and I had vaginal bleeding and there was risk of losing the pregnancy. Um, then I developed hydronephrosis, which is um, a backing up of your kidney um, with, as a result of the pregnancy. I was induced at 38 weeks and delivered a very strapping um, wild man named Jack. <laughs> and he, he still lives up to his name. Um, after delivering Jack, I had a follow-up CT scan for uh, the hydronephrosis, and they wanted to make sure that it, it, it was um, repairing itself. In that scan, a dermoid cyst appeared, and my gynecologist, who I had been with for 10 years, had said to me, oh, don't worry about that. That's, that's nothing. We would have never known that you had that if we hadn't had done the CT scan for the hydronephrosis. It's completely benign. It will never cause you any problems. Please just don't worry about it. That's all she kept saying to me. Fast forward eight years. New state, new doctor. I had the same dull pain on my right side that I had had through my entire pregnancy. And, um, but my periods had gotten so heavy that I pretty much couldn't leave the house. Um, I was passing large clots, and um, it was really affecting my quality of life at that point. So I kept, um, I also started to develop migraine headaches, which I had never had before. So I went to the doctor again, had another pelvic ultrasound, and they said that my uterus was tilted backwards, and it was very hard to see anything with an abdominal ultrasound. But there was nothing to worry about. I must be experiencing perimenopause. I was 42 at that point. 
Um, I went about my daily life because everybody kept telling me not to worry about it. I continued to have very heavy periods, problems with abdominal cramping, diarrhea, the continual headaches, and I didn't have, um, I didn't go anywhere without ammonium 18 because of the diarrhea being so bad. In June 2011, or 2007, sorry, I began to bleed so heavily for almost two weeks. I became extremely anemic. And I was instructed to take an iron supplement. Again, they were like, oh, you must be starting perimenopause. You'll probably go through menopause early. Don't worry about it. Um, as I started to take the pill, and, and I stopped, when I started to take the pill, I did stop bleeding. Um, but then, two weeks later, it started, I started to bleed again. When I called the doctor, they explained that it was just my body adjusting to the change in the hormone levels from the pill, and not to worry about it. It would improve with time. July turned into the same situation with a heavy period, and still I was very run down. I had three children at this point, and I could barely function and get through the day. In August of 2007, while traveling, I started to pass such large clots, I had, I had gushing bleeding, I felt like I was hemorrhaging and was going to bleed to death in my in-laws' um, guest room. When I came back, I had a uterine ultrasound where they discovered that the wall of my uterus was very thick and had large fibroid cysts within it. At the beginning of the ultrasound, the technician was chatting away and she was looking for my ovaries and she found the left ovary, no problem, it looked completely normal. And then she's like, oh. I can't find your right ovary, but don't worry about it. That's normal. It must have just atrophied and shriveled up. This happens all the time. So again, I have another new doctor, and her solution to the situation was to do a uterine ablation, and that would stop the bleeding. I would get my quality of life back. My anemia would be eliminated, and everything would be fine. Well, I was about to schedule the uterine ablation when I started to think about the fact that did I really want to go in and mess with the cells of the lining of my uterus? Was that really a good idea? By mid-September, the gynecologist that was treating me was leaving the practice to go on leave, and I was referred to uh, a managing partner. And I was able to convince the managing partner instead of doing the uterine ablation, to go in and remove my uterus laparoscopically. He thought this was a great idea. He was like a kid in a candy store. Oh, I love doing laparoscopic surgeries. We don't get to do this anymore, and it's like playing a video game. <laughs> this will be great. Don't worry about it. No problem. Simple, same-day surgery, in and out. Everything will be fine. Boy, were we all in for a huge surprise. The surgery was scheduled for late October, and my husband's job was eliminated on October 1st. So we moved the date up to October 12th of 2007. I was very nervous. I just had this feeling inside that something was very wrong. I was worrying, even though everybody kept telling me, don't worry. I kept saying to my sister, what if they find something when they go in there? And she's like, what are they going to find? They're going to take out your uterus, he's going to play his video games, everything's going to be okay. No biggie. As I came out of the blur of the anesthesia, the doctor was waving a picture in my face. That was the picture. And telling me that the surgery had to be stopped after he had removed the right ovary. What he discovered after he had done, removed the right ovary was that there were white spots on the wall behind the ovary and that the ovary itself was encased in cancerous cells. This is what he said to me. We are sending you to a different hospital to have a debulking surgery. I was told to stop before I went any further with this surgery, so I wasn't able to take out your uterus. You have ovarian cancer, but I don't think it will take your life. 
I was a 44-year-old mother of three, and I was just told that I had something to worry about. I had the staging and hysterectomy surgery two weeks later, on October 25, 2007. The surgeon was pleased with how little cell growth there was once my uterus was removed. The cancer had spread behind the uterine wall and into the left ovary, but there was no indication of disease on or near the colon, and there were no acetates, acetates in the peritoneal cavity. There was very little growth to even biopsy. They had caught it early. We had caught it early. I had caught it early because I worried. My final diagnosis was a stage 2C, grade 1, low malignant tendency, serous adenocarcinoma with significant sonoma calcification. How do you like that? <laughs> That's a mouthful, right? I went through six rounds of chemo over the course of 18 weeks of the typical protocol of Taxol and Carboplatinum. And I finished chemo three years ago this past March. And I'm proud to say that I am cancer free today. And I have my annual follow up this afternoon with the CAT scan and hopefully I will continue to be cancer free. But the only reason they were able to catch this at stage 2C was the fact that I worried. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.
what's remarkable here also is the fact that I was diagnosed the first day that I went in to have this looked at. This is unbelievable that it was diagnosed that first day. The diagnosis was, Jim, you know, went a long time. My first trip in, and I was diagnosed with stage 3C carcinoma sarcoma ovarian cancer. So things started to roll quite quickly. It was in um, uh, less than a week. It was the holidays. This is a problem, you know. Uh, I was sent to, again, a gynecological oncologist. Good move on the part of that PA. She and her team sent me immediately to a gynecological oncology. And I did have the surgery quickly. Um, then it started. <laughs> so my first rounds of treatment were carboplatin. Uh, no, actually cisplatin and um, Taxol, and I had an IP where they put it directly into your abdomen. Um, a little tough, uh, not much fun, but I got through six treatments. Um, I got through all of them and uh, was considered cancer free. That lasted about a year, a little over a year, something like that, and um, my CE125 started to, to go up. Now, CE125, I'm assuming you learned about this, it is not a good screening tool. It really isn't. And it really isn't a good diagnostic tool either. In many cases, it can be deceiving. You can get false, <laughs> false positives and false negatives. Um, perhaps if that had been part of this blood testing that I had done that first day, it was 2,500. Normal should be in the 35 range. That would have also um, been an indication that they should pursue it. I still was diagnosed that first day, but if that, you know, the other things hadn't led to that, that would have been a key to, to get going. So my uh, C125 started to go up in August of 2009, uh, over 800. Okay, what's going on? Get the CT scans. Well, it's metastasized and has some small pockets in my abdomen. Likes to metastasize where they have that port in my abdomen. So it's a weak spot. And I was a little cancer, so I was love to look for those weak spots. So I started a traditional carboplatin and taxol, just IV. Went through all that and was done in February of 2010. Once again, I'm cancer free. Well, June 2010, we're having a three month checkup. Have a CT scan, oh, it's really clean. High fives, you know, it's doing well. Ooh, if that C125 is up to 100, something maybe is cooking, I don't know what. Within weeks on the 4th of July, I start having some bleeding. Well, everything's gone, you know, but that's bad. So we go in, exams, test, and I have a tumor on my vaginal. Okay, what do we do about that? Okay, let's try some radiation. So I had radiation to just my pelvic area, seeing if we could get that tumor that was in my vagina. Um, sort of good news was that the radiation um, stopped the tumor from growing, but it did not eradicate it. So we were a little disappointed in that. C125 again has started to rise a little bit. So now what are we going to do? We think that the taxol carboplatin routine might not be, am I resistant to the platinum? We're not sure. That might not be the answer right now. Probably going to have to try something else. So we decided to try a phase one trial. So in November of this year, of the actual 2010, I started um, a phase one trial. And what it was, it was the traditional taxol carboplatin with an oral drug that would serve as an enhancer of the chemo. And, um, you know, let's see how, how that works. Um, really, some good news about that is it just really wrapped that cancer. It, it attacked it very well and quite quickly. The results were really good. It did enhance that chemo. <laughs> so it was, you know, all of the side effects and all of the chemo were enhanced. So it was kind of a rough, a kind of a rough time. Um, in February, end of February this year, um, 
I had progressed along, and it was really taking control. It was taking control of my magnesium. I was having magnesium infusions twice a week to try to get that magnesium where it likes to be. Uh, the carpal platen will do that. Um, and I also had started to have some really severe allergic reactions. We weren't sure where it was coming from. Was it the experimental drug? We didn't know. The red face. I had to have two complete face fields. I was telling <laughs> more about that. I don't recommend the process, but my face is totally peeled twice. The island drug kind of opted up trying to get me through. We were hoping for six cycles. Uh, we stopped after five. Um, the allergic reaction was too much. The magnesium levels were too bad. Um, I did try to take just the oral drug for a little bit, hoping it would serve as an inhibitor. They don't know it might be an inhibitor. Um, after only two doses of an allergic reaction again. So I have, you know, I'm subsequently off that trial. Um, my CE125, which is a good measure for me, um, we've used it for me um, because it's a good, it might not be for all ovarian cancer survivors, but it's a good indication for me. So um, I, right now I'm at 34, which is pretty good. Uh, we'll take it. Um, we're hoping, of course, for a longer period of time uh, of remission. Um, and so, you know, the battle may continue. You don't know. Hair's coming back. That's good. Um, all that kind of good stuff. This picture is kind of fun. My first round, a couple of my smaller, younger grandchildren, not so sure about losing that hair. And so we decided that they should put that. <laughs> and so they did that. It was it was great fun. So, you know, in speaking to you folks, um, just to let you know that, that you're sometimes you're our first line. You're the ones that talk to us. You know what's going on. We get our symptoms. We're talking about what's going on. And many times it's really you folks are the ones. So I'm asking you to listen to what these women have to say. I just, something's just not, not right. right. My system's always done this, and right now it's doing that, and it it's just not the same. And, and to listen, please, to what they're saying. And maybe someday, in your practices somewhere, somewhere along the line, some woman will give you one of these symptoms, you'll say, you know, I remember and I was finishing up school, day after I took my final exam. <laughs> and there were these ladies that talked about it during the so let's, let's just take a look at that. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's going to make the difference for someone, because it is an early diagnosis. And we appreciate it. Remember us. We are the faces of ovarian cancer. Thank you very much. This is a picture of Pam with her amazing family, Cheryl, who was at all the presentations for daughter-in-law. Um, I think all of us um, uh, are the second line of defense after we leave that medical office is our, our families. And um, uh, I think all three of us are blessed with um, wonderful co-survivors. And um, Pam, uh, you've been involved in a lot of different activities. This is one of the runs that you're taking the town teal in our September is a very football team. That's the football team in my hometown. And uh, uh, September is Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month, so I'll say more about that. Thank you very much, Pam. My name is Laura Clark Hansen. I didn't bring my papers up. I want to refer to something that both Pam and Jan talked about. Um, that it's, it's a question that I hope will come up, but just in case it doesn't, I think I will address it uh, in advance. Um, they, both women talked about something not being right. And in Dr. Barbara Goff's research, um, one of the things that, um, that they learned was that these symptoms, B-E-A-T, these symptoms that they've identified as the classic symptoms, um, one of the ways, because so many women present with these, and it's so confusing, and there are so many you know, other diseases on the your diagnosis differential. One of the things that Dr. Barbara Bob talks about is that, um, it, that it's not only presenting um, and I'm just, oh well, my goodness, hello. <laughs> it's, it's persistent, it's progressive, 
and it's something that's a change, something's not right within the last year. And so that's something important to keep in mind. Um, I'm a ovarian cancer survivor as well. Um, I'm, I'm an actress and I'm a teacher and I'm a director. Um, and I'm actually a very fortunate human being. I was diagnosed in a relatively early stage. 2C is considered relatively early for ovarian cancer. My oncologist referred to it as garden variety, which I found out is epithelial adenocarcinoma. Um, I was really excited when I heard it was high grade, you know, because I'm kind of an overachiever. Um, we discovered, you guys know, uh, high grade means it's more aggressive. Um, and the prognosis is I, I have about a 50-50 chance of recurrence at this point. I was diagnosed in um, December of 2005, and I have been disease-free since that time, so I, I feel very fortunate. My treatment was textbook, very similar to both of theirs, except I didn't have the IP. I had traditional chemotherapy, carboplatin, paclitaxel, six rounds, one every three weeks one or three weeks. Um, I had the, the surgery prior to chemotherapy. Um, the medical student opened me up. My uh, gynecologic oncologist came in and optimally debulked um, after he was called into the room. He, he always hastens it. He says, please don't ever tell anybody that I opened you. That's just horrible. <laughs> Carboplatin and Paclitaxel are our friends. I called them my twin angels. Fortunately, I'm really, really hot, bald. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Paul encouraged, my husband encouraged earrings, and I think that that helped. I took advantage of, and as a, as a PA, I know whatever organization or institution you're working for, you may have access to refer your patients to different kinds of services. For me, I really benefited from some additional services that, that I took advantage of in the clinic where I was being treated. I did music therapy, which was free to any patient that, that wanted to get involved in it. I did, I did art therapy. Um, I did oncology psychotherapy, because I was like, oh, no, I was pretty crazy. Uh, and it really, really did help. I did group therapy. I mean, I, was at, I seemed like every time I was, wasn't going to a chemo appointment, I was going to something else. I did do some retail therapy. I bought some, I bought some ass kicking boots because I thought if you were going to kick cancer's ass, you better be wearing the right boots. And I can't walk very far in these and I can't walk very long, but I look good doing it. As I said, they call ovarian cancer the disease that whispers because these symptoms are so subtle, but I like to call it the chameleon cancer because like that crafty lizard, it hides right in plain sight. You can be looking right at it and you think it's Um, if someone says, in reference to ovarian cancer, if they call it the silent killer, you have my permission to read them the riot act. Because there is nothing silent about it. There's only ignorance to being able to hear its voice. And that's what we're here today to talk about. My symptoms were vivid, and they were clear warning signs. But I didn't know anything about ovarian cancer, so I didn't understand what they meant. I didn't see it. I wrote them off to perimenopause which is the condition du jour. I mean, everybody's talking about it. My girlfriends, my sisters, Oprah. Oprah's all talking about it. She's all about it. Everybody's talking about these emotional and physical changes that we're going through as we tiptoe up to the edge of what Granny calls the change, right? And we're all diagnosing ourselves. I have no medical training. I have no business diagnosing myself. But get me on the internet and I'll diagnose you too. Bloating. That year prior to diagnosis, I found myself, un I'm teaching, unzipping my pants about mid-afternoon, opening them up, floofing my blouse over the top, because I am so bloated, I can't take the pressure of the zipper anymore. I thought I was just getting fat. Frequency of urination. We're private trainers, and it's a different church, it's a different organization every day, and, and uh, I would give my little middle school students a break. I said, just and then I would fight my way through them to get to the bathroom ahead of them because I had to pee constantly. Weight gain. I, my, my belly was starting to become distended and it actually, it actually kind of came to a point, which is I didn't know this. 
Paul had noticed it, chose not to share that piece of information with me. Wise, wise man. Um, it was, it was um, looking kind of um, distorted. Um, gas, dear sweet fancy Moses, the gas. I was jet propelled everywhere I went. <laughs> I'm not kidding, but this is not safe if you're teaching high school and middle school students, because everywhere you go, <laughs> it's, it's, and it's embarrassing. Um, and then around um, the end of that year, around September, I noticed a couple of new nagging issues that kind of piqued my awareness. Um, I've been sick and tap dancing my way through life since I was 18 years old, but now I couldn't finish a sentence without running out of breath shortness of breath, because of that swelling is one of the symptoms of ovarian cancer. Um, I felt winded just walking up a flight of stairs. And then one afternoon in November, when we were picking up voicemail messages, I was sitting at the edge of a hotel bed, <clears throat> somewhere in the Cornhusker State. Um, my pants on zip farting like a motorboat. <laughs> I became keenly aware of what felt like a toad squatting in my uterus. Pressure in the pelvic region is a warning sign of ovarian cancer. I said to Paul, I'm like, I need to see the doctor. And he's like, why? And I said, because there's a toad in my uterus. It's the only way I could explain it. It feels like a toad. And the energy in the room completely changed. It had a kind of like a really freaked out energy to it because the chameleon had revealed itself. Something's not right. Thanksgiving was a week away. Made the appointment to see my family practice doctor, who was aware of the research of Dr. Barbara Goff that was in the process of being done. She was on high alert as soon as she snapped off those gloves. She did not ignore the signs. Within 10 days, uh, with, uh, she ran the traditional test, transvaginal ultrasound, CA-125. Mine was only 58, which usually s doesn't signal ovarian cancer. It's outside the normal range, 0 to 35, but it doesn't put them on high alert. Transvaginal ultrasound, uh, CA-125, and what was the other one? Oh, the physical exam. Um, they were convinced that they wanted to move forward quickly. Um, so I was referred to, and I saw within 72 hours, a gynecologist, not a gynecologic oncologist, a gynecologist, and she recommended a hysterectomy or hysterectomy with a lateral incision in case they needed to do any staging with the lymph nodes. Ten days after my initial appointment, I woke from anesthesia. this amazing gynecologic oncologist <clears throat> was standing behind my uh, gynecologist. And, and I first thing I said, ah, oh, shit, because she had told me I wouldn't see her for 10 days, and so I knew something was wrong. And she said, you have ovarian cancer, but the good news is we got it all. And the even better news is that it was a the honor call. It's their policy at this hospital. If you open a woman up and she has ovarian cancer or cancer of any gynecologic variety. They either close you and wait or they, call, they bring in the on-call. And I was fortunate to have the on-call brought in who, you know, optimally developed me and, um, uh, and staged me at stage 2C eventually. I'm grateful that my primary family doc did not ignore the signs. And now it's your turn. It's your turn. You're at first line of defense from this point forward. I see PA because I'm outside that five-year margin. We rely on you. We need you. We need you to educate women, and we need you to be educated about what these morning signs are because you are the early detection test. Thanks. We'll take questions at this point. I wanted to mention quickly, September is ovarian cancer on the other side. And we want to thank you for listening and being present to us. Questions? Anybody have a question? Yes. The first speaker, what happened with uh, you and your...
insurance situation as far as your treatment? Mm. Um, we went on COBRA uh, a week after the surgery. So the surgery was covered in kind of regular insurance, but then we went on COBRA and um, started looking for alternative insurance. And no one would touch me. And fortunately, um, we were a month away from the expiration of the 18 months of COBRA when my husband found another full time job. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, uh, the gentleman, and then we'll go to the, the um, woman in the red. What have you all found that to help with chemo side effects? Was there anything that worked particularly well for any of you? And? Well, um, my support group. <laughs> um, I have found uh, that my faith uh, and my support group and my husband saying, what do you want for supper? And me saying nothing. And he's saying that's not a good answer. <laughs> and, and making sure that I eat um, lots of fluids. Um, and sometimes it's really hard. I don't, you don't want to drink that water. I don't want to have that Gatorade. I don't, and that's what I would say fluids are probably uh, among the best. They have so many wonderful drugs now. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they do not want you to be sick. I was told you can, you can throw up once, you, you know, you get sick the second time. That's not acceptable. Because you find that the medical teams really will do whatever they can. I've been very, very blessed that I really haven't called on the drugs very much. Um, the exhaustion is probably important, and it's just a matter of giving into it. Um, and, and I still continue to exercise and be active. And I don't know if they if from, but, but a lot of this is up right up here. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's really up here, and so that's where where my battles are. It's up here, and. Um, so the support and the faith and, and all that kind of stuff, I, I hope it doesn't sound kind of hokey, but it really does make a difference. And if you're having problems with that, you know, find some help. And um, I, I did acupuncture in addition to that. And um, here, I don't know where you're going to be practicing, um, but I do know that here at the U, they, they offer acupuncture as part of the, um, on the and there's an acupuncturist who's, um, uh, specializes in oncology acupuncture, and um, uh, I, I've known some individuals who have had some just wonderful success with acupuncture. And um, I personally, when you talk about being in your head, a lot of that in your head, um, Zofran is a wonderful drug uh, for the nausea. Um, I also found that part of that side effects are, are your mental state and your emotional state. And so I, I really did that. I had a lot of benefit from, from psychotherapy. I also um, did, took a course here at UW um, with a psychology group um, called Mindfulness Awareness. Mm -hmm. And it teaches you how to think in the present. And you don't look back because there's nothing you can do about the past. And you don't look too far ahead because in our situation with a 50-50 chance of it coming back, you don't want to look too far ahead. So you live in the present day and that helped me get through. And the other thing that I can say to you guys is Listen to your patients that are going through chemo about what they're saying they're having side effects for of. I had really bad pain in my feet, and they just looked at me like I was crazy. And you feel like you're crazy anyways. <laughs> you know, you, you, you have a hysterectomy, so you're in instantaneous menopause, and that, is, that wreaks havoc on your body, and then they give you um, prednisone, to counteract the side effects of the chemo, and then you have this chemo. And I love watching like these shows on TV where people are going through chemo. I remember, I think it was Brothers and Sisters, and Kitty was having chemo, and she's sitting in the chair, and she's like, ooh, I feel it. Uh, no. <laughs> you don't. But you do have all of these really weird side effects, and everybody's different. So 
Help your patients to not feel like they're crazy. Just even if you just listen to them, you don't. You're not going to be able to do anything for them. But listening and showing that you care will make a huge difference, especially mentally. And was your was the feet stuck in neuropathy, or was that the burning? Neuropathy. Neuropathy. And I still have it. Yeah. That neuropathy can be long lasting. Thank you for your question. Yes. Um, I know most of you mentioned that you were diagnosed with head symptoms when you were kind of in a perimenopausal age frame. Mm -hmm. What is the, I guess, the age frame that women actually are being diagnosed or should Sixty percent of women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer are age 55 plus. And so mm -hmm. the bulk of it, that means 45 percent are are Jan's age and younger. There's a wonderful survivor of who we know in the Milwaukee area, her name is Katie, and she was diagnosed at age 21. So it's not unusual. Um, I just refer to it as not the ovarian cancer patient, not Jan McNally, as the 44-year-old ovarian cancer patient. Because really, I shouldn't, that was too early to be in a perimenopause. Yeah, she doesn't even desire hair. I mean, that's wrong. <laughs> you do? Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's what is that? That's like you know, losing your hair is that when it comes back, it comes back even grayer. Well, at least mine did. Oh, it did. Well, that's good. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, is that bloating related to uh, any digestive process, or is it just completely on its own? The bloating? Uh, uh, that's an excellent question, and I honestly, I, I, I can't give you a, um, a medical answer. Does anybody want to address what it felt like from the patient's perspective? For me, I think, um, and maybe I didn't emphasize that strong, it was the acid reflux that I had, and, and it was, the tumor was that large, mm -hmm. and it was pushing up on my stomach. So, I don't know medically if it's, if it's the tumor or if it's fluids. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's a digestive question for you to find out yeah. medically what that bloating is. I think the mass in my abdomen was, they told me was pushing up on my stomach and that's why I had the acid reflux. And the size, of, the size that these can grow to without having extreme pain is, is really pretty astonishing. Um, one of my ovaries was about this big. And you know they're supposed to be about the size of almond. So that is what it's and then that later in the day, and the farting, I mean, I think it's the bill of gas, I know for me. Well, it's, it's the pressure on the bladder that makes you have to pee all the time. So it's really pretty much related to tumor, I think. It's a good point. Good question. Mm -hmm. Yes? I was just curious about if any of you have pursued genetic testing for the BRCA mm -hmm. mutation, and is that something that, that most patients do? Uh, I pursued it because I have, it just, not because I have children, but because I have eight sisters, and because I have um, so many nieces and nephews, because a nephew could carry it to a great niece. Um, and I tested negative for it, but because I have a sister who had endometrial cancer, and remember, let's do it together. <laughs> Breast, <laughs> colon, and ovarian. It's brain and body part, boys and girls. Thank you. <laughs> there's I, there's a test that can be done also for for um, uh, for for a, a, a different genetic anomaly that they're looking at, which we need to take a look at now. I did not have Barca, um, primarily because of the insurance issues. Um, my sister was diagnosed with breast cancer, and her breast cancer was non-hormone receptive positive. My ovarian cancer was hormone receptor positive, oh, there's no which is the opposite of what it's supposed to be, or what it typically is. There was, there was a lot of breast cancer in my family, quite a bit. Two sisters, four or five nieces, um, and when I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, kind of tipped the scale for the entire family. So all of the um, my nieces had, had the BRCA1, BRCA2 test. So did I. We. None of us have it. So it was it was surprising. I always kind of thought, well, I wasn't going to be too surprised if I showed up with breast cancer. 
but we do not have the BRCA1, BRCA2, but they are looking, there's some other familial relationship, gene relationship, they might find that little connection at some point of all of that. And you might find it useful to know that there's legislation that doesn't allow for you to be rejected because a family member has tested positive for the BRCA gene. Um, however, you can be rejected for life insurance. There's no, there's no legislation for that. Yes? Um, some of your discovery doses is rather, you know, being rather large pushing up in the stomach. Is this something that like, should have been found or would have been found on the pelvic exam? On the pelvic exam. Does somebody take that? Because I can, I, I had had a physical um, in June of that, so it wasn't like I was a, it's the, it's the speed at which these grow as well. I had also had, um, I was diagnosed in December and in April, I've always been a good girl, mm -hmm. and I've always had everything, and I had a full exam at that time. Again, if this um, PA that had worked with me in the original diagnosis, if she had done a pelvic or, or a rectal exam on me, I don't know what she would have felt, but I'll, I'm sure she would have felt that tumor pressing on my colon because they did think um, that I might have to have a resection if that tumor had invaded the colon. It did not, unfortunately. It was just really good news um, in, in a whole bunch of not good news. Um, but I think that they would have felt that with an exam, right? Okay. At this point, um, what I'm going to ask us to do, before we can think of the time, is I want us to do the post evaluation so that I can get the data and because I know that they really do like um, to have that. And then if, if you want to take a few more minutes, we can um, answer any further questions afterwards. If something occurs to you, especially while we're taking the survey. So, can we take half? I'll start at the top.